Hello and welcome back to another episode of James and Chris Science Videos. Today we're going to be looking at separating mixtures and of the different techniques, some of the keywords involved with them and when we should be using the different techniques for the different mixtures. So before I start off about these different techniques that I'm going to show you, I'm going to start off with what is a mixture. Now a mixture are any two substances put together that do not chemically join. If they chemically join, that's called something else, we do that later. But at the moment we've got two things put together that haven't joined together. So we're going to start off with the first one. Our first method is what we do when we've got two liquids that don't mix. The example I've got for you today is oil and water, which you can see forms nice two clear layers here. The oil floats on top, the water at the bottom. So the method for doing this is very, very simple. It's called decanting. So to de decant a liquid, you just pour off the top layer and the bottom layer remains. I've now separated some of the oil from the water. It's the simplest method. So decanting, it's just a case of pouring off different liquids. So number two, um, number two is something we call sieving. Sieving is where we've mixed two solids together and the solids have got different sizes. So here, not a very subtle mix, but I've got marbles and I've got sand. And if I want to separate those very quickly, I put them in the sieve, the sand passes through the sieve, and I'm left, in the end, with my marbles. I've lost my marbles. And actually, all my larger bits of rock. So I've managed to separate different solids of different sizes. So separating technique is number two, it's called sieving. So we're still on to very, very easy ones. Um, third one is whenever we've got a magnetic element inside our mixture. So this here is iron and sand. And very, very easy. If we've got anything magnetic to separate them, all I need is a magnet and the magnet, I don't know if you can see that, and the magnet will separate, you see that? All the iron will come out and there is my iron. So anything that involves that's cobalt, nickel and iron and steel, I can use a magnet to separate. Our fourth technique is what to do if I've got a mixture of a solid that is insoluble, that will not dissolve inside water. So here I've got water and sand and I want to separate them. So to do that, I'm going to need this little setup here. We've got some names. This is called a filter funnel. This is called a filter paper. Filter paper is very easy to set up. Oh, I've got two in there. But filter paper is very easy to set up. You take a piece of paper, you fold it in half, you fold it in half again, and you then open up on one leaf, and we've got there a filter paper that's ready. You pour them in together, and, whoops, probably put a bit much in there. And we'll get that going through nice and quickly. And you see it going through. And we've got some key terms that I want to go through with this. So, there we go, that's pretty much done. So, the key terms we've got is the liquid that's come through, so the separated water, we call the filtrate. That has gone through the filter paper, the filtrate is at the bottom there. The sand that's left in here, and you can see the sand at the bottom of that, the term we give for that is that is called the residue. So the residue is inside the filter paper and the filtrate is what has come through the liquid. So, technique number four. And technique number five. Um, here I've got some salt and some water. So, what do we do if we've got a solution of a solvent and a soluble solute? So, in this case, I want to separate these two. Now, the technique you use is going to depend whether you want to get the water or the salt back. So, in this particular technique, I'm aiming to get the salt back not the water. 
So what I want to do is I want to make the water disappear. And I'm going to do that by heating it. And as you recall from the changes of state video, when a liquid turns into a gas, it, it's called evaporation, it's going to evaporate off. So the whole term for this separating is called evaporation. So what I'm going to do very, very quickly, I'm going to put that under there. And we're going to let that heat up. And what's going to happen is this video will phase out. And then when it phases back, um, we'll be able to show you the end of this. Okay, we're about two minutes into the boiling. If you have a look now, you can see it's boiling off nicely. So the water is evaporating quite rapidly. And on the side, I don't know if you can see it, but you've got little white deposits around the side, and that's the salt that's going to be there. You can't see that on the camera, so I'm not going to that. Okay, trust me, <laughs> there is some white powder that goes across. And as we're heating this off, as the water is kicked out and evaporated into the atmosphere, the salt particles, in this case sodium chloride, are left on the side of the evaporator bed. Okay. This is only to get the solute back. We can't get the solvent back. For that, we need a separate technique. So okay, so here we are at the end, and you can see inside now, we've got all the salt crystals that have formed. It's still quite hot, so I'm not gonna to touch it. We've got the salt crystals all forming there, and the water has disappeared. We've separated the two, and we're left with the salt. So, what to do then if we've got a solution of a solute which is dissolved and we want to get the solvent back. In this case, I've got salty water, I want to get the water back. I can't use evaporation, the water will have disappeared. So I need to use a different method. The method we use is this. This is called distillation. Now distillation involves a couple of pieces of equipment that I want to just point out to you and show you. Um, this bit here it's got the lovely name, it's called a round bottomed flask, which is just a flask with a round bottom. It goes up the top, we have a side arm delivery that goes here, we have a thermometer to keep an eye on the temperature, and then we've got a device here that is called the Leibig condenser. Now the Leibig condenser, I don't know if you can see, we've got a tap that goes down here, that goes across, and it will filter at the bottom. And when I turn the tap on here, you'll see the water filling up the tube and then coming out the top and I keep that running. So we've got a constant supply of cool water going here. In the middle, I don't know if you can see through the camera, but there is a tube that goes down the middle so the water never goes in the middle of that. It's surrounded by glass. Now we fill up, this is quite an important thing that they like to ask, we fill up from the bottom and it comes out at the top. If I did it the other way, I wouldn't surround the glass and so I'd only get partial coverage. So it's always best to go from the bottom and to have the water coming out at the top. So what we're gonna do now is, whilst that's running, I'm gonna get some of my solution. I'm gonna give a little stir like this. And I'm only gonna put a little bit in just to make it speed up a little bit. And I'm gonna take my side arm out like this I'm going to carefully pour in my salt solution. That's about all I need. Now, I'm going to put into this bit something called anti-bumping crystals, which if you've ever done this without this, you'll know exactly why. This gives the water, let me put them into there, and they just got the bottom. This gives the water a point on which it can boil on. Without it, it'll boil across the whole bottom, and you'll find that it soon rises up and tries to come out of the flask. So, anti-bumping crystals in, salt solution in, and I'll refit the side arm into there. Brilliant. The water, which you can see, is still running. So the water's going up through, and that will hopefully cool off the water vapor as it comes and condense it, which is why it's called a condenser. So, let us quickly light my Bunsen burner. Making sure it's on yellow flame and away. And I'll put it onto blue flame underneath and immediately can you see the water vapor already heading up. 
we go this side slowly. So I'll position that right, which I have. And you'll see the water start to boil. You can see already it's boiling on the anti-bumping crystals. So the point for them to boil is there, which is creating the steam and the water vapour that will go up the tube. It'll come down the side arm until it gets to this point. And this bit will cool it down and condense it. And we will end up with water, pure water, coming out the bottom. And we'll leave that there. That's going to be a much I don't know if you can see here. Let's give it a little tap. There we go. It's not ready to come out just yet. There we go. So what we have here in this bit, let's turn that off. Thank you. Um, here is our pure water. So we've separated the water from the salt solution. Only a little bit at the moment. If I left it longer, I would have got more out. Um, how can I test that it was pure? Um, well, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So if I was to boil this, um, I could check that it was pure by checking the boiling temperature of that water. So, on to number seven. Excellent, so now we're on to number seven. This here is fractional distillation. And it's used when we've got two liquids that come together and do not separate into layers. So the two um, liquids I've got, I've got methanol and I've got water. And I put them together and you can see straight away that unlike the oil and water, that has mixed and I can't decant that. We need a separate method for how to do that. So the science we're going to use is we're going to use our knowledge of boiling points. And we use our knowledge of boiling points to boil off the methanol at a different temperature to the water. We know water boils off at 100 degrees Celsius. Methanol is about 50 degrees Celsius. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this equipment here, which looks very similar to the distillation experiment we just showed you. Only difference is we've got this tower here, this fractionating tower, fractional distillation tower here. And we've got this here instead of a Bunsen burner. So I'm going to very quickly talk about why we use an electric heater, not a Bunsen burner with this. And there's two reasons. First of all, we're going to need a very precise temperature. And you'll find with an electric heater, we've got a very precise way of adjusting the heat. So my control of the heat in a fractional distillation column needs to be quite precise. Bunsen burners are too inaccurate. The second point of why we use an electric heater is if I look at the bottle of methanol, I've got two symbols at the bottom. It's poisonous um, and it's flammable. Flammable materials and Bunsen burners are not a good mix. So what do we do? Once we put the mixture into here, exactly the same will happen as distillation. We heat it up and we get to 50 degrees Celsius and we will start to evaporate and boil the methanol off. Now, as you come up here, you can see the little spikes that go here. Now, the reason for them, as we know, things do not evaporate just at the boiling point, they'll evaporate before. For example, if there's a puddle outside and the sunny day is there, the water will evaporate and go in. The water doesn't boil, it evaporates, and so we get water particles, as well as ethanol, methanol particles, coming off, and the spikes are there are to provide cool points for the water to condense. And once it's condensed on those spikes, it will drop back down. So guaranteeing, hopefully, that only the ethanol will get past those, sorry, methanol in this case. And as it goes onto here, exactly the same as before, we've got a laid big condenser. We've got some water that I'll run here that is constantly flowing through there, keeping that cold. We've got a thermometer here so we can monitor the temperature as close as we can and we will allow that to heat up, the methanol to condense here, and then we would be able to run off and separate the two liquids. So this is fractional distillation. It's like distillation, but with an extra part attached. Okay, on to our final and eighth separating technique. This is a technique called chromatography. And this is used when you want to separate two solutes from a solution. So a great example um, that us teachers tend to use is inks, because inks are very rarely one dye used. Usually we use two or three dyes. 
So I want to take you very quickly through the process, show you how it works, and then give you a couple of practical applications for this. So what do you need? You need a piece of folded paper, you need a pen, a ruler, a pencil, and a beaker of water with a little bit of water at the bottom. So what we're going to do, first stage, we're going to take our piece of paper, um, it doesn't have to be shaped like this, this is just the paper as I found it, and we're going to put a pencil line across the bottom. It's important we use pencil because pencil is insoluble in water and that will not dissolve or move in the water. Onto that line, we are going to put a dot of the ink that we are going to use. In this case, I've got a brown colour. That we then take and we are going to use a splint. It doesn't have to be a splint. I'm just going to fold it over and paper clip it so it stays secure. So here is my point, my pencil line and filter paper. Now I'm going to put that in and it's important that the water level is below the line of the pencil. So I put this into here and you can hopefully see inside there that the water line is a little bit away from the pencil line. Now immediately I put it in there, I don't know if you can see, but the water is beginning to move up the paper. And as it moves up the paper, it's going to start taking some of the colours of the pens with it. The more soluble the ink, the quicker it'll move. The less soluble it is, the slower it'll take. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast forward the video and I'm going to show what it looks like in about five minutes time. It's like watching paint dry. <laughs> Okay, so this is about five minutes later, and you can already see that the inks have started to split. We've got the blue ink that's mixed in, and that is the most soluble, so that is headed towards the top. The least soluble is the pink, and that's remained at the bottom. There's also a yellow in there, and that's the third most soluble, so that's somewhere in the middle. So we can use it, and eventually over time, it would separate completely into three completely separate dots. Now, why do we bother doing this? Well, for pens, eh, it looks very nice and pretty, but th there's got to be some kind of application. And the main application for this um, is to help us analyse what is inside mystery liquids. A great practical example of this is they, they use chromatography when looking at urine tests for athletes. So if they have taken a drug to performance enhance, in the urine, that is going to have different solubility rates. And so you will find a certain place where a drug would be. So it's not done on a piece of filter paper in a beaker of water. It's done with a computer and an analyst that's going to look at the positions of each of the different solvents and solutes. But what they can do is they can work out by how far it's travelled what substance it is and so they can prove very quickly with urine sampling whether you have taken a drug or not and so that's how they use um, chromatography for different ways of measuring different solutes all mixed together so as usual i will hopefully put on a google doc worksheet which you can work on to help yourself to go through all of these techniques also there'll be a sporkle quiz to reinforce the key terms Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.